I'll open your Bibles to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. The Gospel of John. Together, we're going to read the first 18 verses of John chapter 1 this morning. If you do not have a Bible with you, you're welcome to pick one up. There there should be one in front of you, uh, a black ESV that uh, you can use. But it's important that we see this together. I know you've heard me say that before, but if you're not seeing this, you're just taking my word for it. Okay? We're not, we're not members of a blind faith. We're members of a thinking community, a learning community that's being transformed by the renewing of our minds. And the way that our minds are renewed is through the Word of God. So I hope that you have a copy to see that this morning. John chapter 1, verse 1, all the way through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about Him and cried out, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because He was before me. For from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For from the law was given through Moses, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, He has made Him know. Father, I I come to you once more, recognizing that wars all over the world are taking place this morning because of this introduction because of our God and our King, who is Jesus Christ. Father, it's, uh, wars are taking place because of the belief of Jesus and the cause of Jesus and the work of Jesus that is being done. Wars in our own community through words and strife and hate are being committed because of who we believe Jesus to be. God, may you strengthen us today into knowing who Jesus is. God, I pray your blessing upon this time in these first 18 verses in the Gospel of John. To you be the glory and honor this morning. Amen. Amen. Well, at the beginning of every good book, every essay, every letter, every movie, every speech, there is always a what? An introduction. An introduction. An introduction serves as a way to set the stage, so to speak, for the actors in the story and maybe giving uh, a a piece of the plot um, of what is about to happen. The same with uh, a musical, right? It's actually my favorite way to think about this, that in musicals, you know, at the very beginning, the overture plays and you hear all of the character, the the music that is specific for each character, you hear all of it played at the very beginning. Why? So that it introduces the character to the story or the characters to the story you're about to see, okay? So in the book of John, the gospel of John, there's nothing different. These 18 verses serve as an introduction to, who, to whom this book is all about. And might I say, the person whom this entire universe is all about. It's about Jesus. Not about you. Not about me. 
not about our likes, dislikes, or wants. The entire universe has been set up to bring glory and honor to one person. So this morning, let me introduce you to Jesus, the Son of God, through John 1 through 18. We can walk away this morning from this text knowing many things about Jesus, but I want you to walk away specifically with three specific categories of what we are to mainly know about Jesus from this text, from this introduction, okay? Three main categories, and here's the first one. Jesus is eternally God. Eternally God. I think it's interesting, John's gospel does not trace Jesus's lineage the way that the other gospels do. Have you noticed that? The other gospels go back in a human way, right? Jesus was born of this person, which was born of this person, which was born of this person. And go back, going back to David, Luke goes back to Adam. Um, and John says, that's not far enough. That's not far enough. That's not good enough because Jesus didn't come purely from man. He is eternal. Look at how John introduces him in that first sentence. In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Word. Not, not that Jesus is words. That's not what John is saying. Nor is Jesus a word. John introduces Jesus as definite article, go back to English, the word. As to say, as to say, he is the very beginning of the witness of God. We could not have witnessed God without this word. I want to show you uh, Genesis chapter one, the first three verses, they're up here on the screen. Um, in the beginning, that's interesting, John uses the same words as Moses in Genesis chapter one. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. So it's dark, right? That's, that's plain, that's clear. In the beginning, it was dark. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Make the connections. Let's make the connections here. God was not seen or witnessed in the beginning, even by the cosmos, even by the pure substance that was around him as God for all of eternity. God was not witnessed. He was, he was there. He always, always has been, always will be. He was there. But God said, let there be light, as if he spoke. The first witness of God, the very first thing that was done to light the lighter in the very dark room was God speaking. Jesus is what he spoke. Jesus is the very power of fulfilling God's desires. Do you want to do the will of God? Do you want to know the will of God? Look to Jesus. Do you want to accomplish the will of the Father on earth? You got to get to know Jesus. Because Jesus is the very power of fulfilling the desires of God. God wanted to be revealed, so he spoke. He spoke the word. He spoke the power of Jesus. John tells us that the word was with God and the word was God. Now, I, I want to make a doctrinal difference here that... Um, Jehovah's Witness, if you ever have them knock on your door and come to speak to you, I want you to know something about their theology. In their Bible, in their translation, their translation of the Bible, this text reads, in the beginning, the, the word was, uh, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was a God. See the difference? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God, not the Word was God. They believe that Jesus was a God of many, because 
If you go deeper into their theology, they believe that they can become a God as well. But Jesus was with God because he was God. This is the doctrine of the Trinity here. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We see it in Genesis 1, 1 through 3. We see it in John 1. When John says he was with God, it is a way of saying uh, in the Greek language, they were together face to face in perfect unity and harmony. They were together as a, as a tight-knit son and his father. They were together because Jesus is God. The Word, who is Jesus, is God. Eternally, through all time, he has been with God. He has been the fulfillment of the revelation of God. John goes on to say that all things have been made by him. Because... Again, the doctrine of the Trinity, Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is God. That's the whole point. We, we talked about this last week. That's the entire point of the Gospel of John. Come and meet Jesus, the Son of God. Paul tells us this too. We've already read it this morning, but I, I want you to look again at Colossians 1, 15 through 17. It says, He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the revelation of the invisible God. You can't see God. He's the firstborn of all creation. Why? Because the first thing that was created, so to speak, in the world was light. He spoke Jesus and Jesus revealed him. He's the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So John wants you to know that Christ has created all things. And all means all, and that's what all means. I'm going to repeat this again because John, John comes back to this word in John 3.16 and, and many other places in John. He uses this word all. But add this to your theology. Make note of this in your mind or on, a, on paper that God is the one who created all of the natural substance that has ever been made in the world. Anything that has ever been made has come from that very first week of creation. Therefore, you too are a continuation of the original creation in the beginning. Pretty crazy to think about. You have a history that goes back all the way to day one as well. He always has been light, too, right? We see that in Genesis 1. We see it in John 1. The very first thing that God spoke to bear witness of himself was what? It wasn't a billboard. It wasn't a sign. It wasn't a thing. It was light. It was light. Light still perplexes scientists today, the full spectrum of light and what they know about it. It's because Jesus is the light. He is the revelation of all things. Jesus is the revealer of all things, including your heart. Why are there wars? Why do people have strife with other people? Why do people want things and are upset when they, get, when they don't get what they want? It's because there's something hidden in your heart. And the truth, or morality, or grace, or uh, the righteousness of God reveals the things of our heart. And he has been doing this from the very beginning. And he will do it again when he comes the second time. Right? We just looked at this at, at men's group on Wednesday evening that there's going to be some that are going to definitely know that Jesus is returning and they're still going to go, no, mountains fall on me. I would rather die than have to meet this God. Jesus reveals our hearts. Jesus reveals what it is that you truly want. 
John also states here that darkness has not overcome the light, meaning that Jesus has not somehow become more light since the beginning, nor has he become less. And though it may seem that we that evil grows or that evil has, be, has had some kind of upper hand in the last days, we need, to, we need to understand that evil never claims victory over God. Good always wins over evil, and there is none good but God. God always has the victory, and the light will be the sovereign victor all the way to the end. So this morning, before we move on to the second part, the second thing that we can see in this text, what is revealed in your heart about Jesus? What does Jesus reveal in your heart this morning? When you hear that Jesus reveals your hearts, what comes to mind? What comes up to your conscience? And so I I will tell you that this morning, let the light of Jesus expose desires that are deeply rooted inside of you. Because in each one of us, there's always this temptation to want something solely and primarily with more gusto than to know Jesus, than to worship Christ, than to bring light into the world. There's always something that's tempting us, tempting us to put more energy or time or compassion or passion into that than Christ. So what is it for you this morning? Let Christ expose it, and then let it go in the name of Jesus this morning. The second thing that we can know is this. Jesus is understandably God. Jesus is understandably God. See in verse 6, there is a man sent from God. That's interesting. God doesn't just create people. He sends people. There are people that are specifically called for specific tasks in the world. Go back to the Colossians text. All of rulers and authorities have been created by God, and they're supposed to be used for God. Right? They're they're pointed. They have a specific task. John, John the Baptist, this is the introduction of John the Baptist. You're seeing another character come into play here. Right? John the Baptist, this is not John the Apostle. John was sent by God for a specific task. He was sent to clear the way for Jesus, and we'll talk about that next week. But if you think of the the Christmas story, I know, some of you don't want to think about Christmas. I'm right there with you. I heard someone say at the craft fair yesterday, let's go home and put up our Christmas tree. And I thought, no. 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 Oh, man. I didn't say it, by the way. (laughs) John knew Jesus, the person, because Jesus was his cousin, right? He knew him. He was was family. And John also knew God. We know that for certain. But John the Baptist was given a calling, was given a task to literally be a martyr of something, That's what the word witness means. He came to be a martyr. He came to be a martyr of Christ after God showed him that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. Right? We'll see that in the coming weeks as well. But John was showed whom Jesus was, that Jesus was the Christ, because he says in John 1, verse 29, it says the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Behold, Meaning, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John had a rich understanding of Old Testament theology. He knew Isaiah 53. He knew that Jesus was the Lamb who was going to be led to the slaughter. And said, look, there's the Lamb of God who takes away all of the sin of the world. And then he goes on to say in John 1, 34, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. 
This is something that John came to understand to be so true, that Jesus was the Son of God, that Jesus was the Christ. He was the salvation of the sinners of the world, the reconciler, the revealer of God himself. He knew that so well that he would lose his head for it. Do you know that so well that you would lose your head for it? Oh, John knew it. John knew it. Jesus, the Son of God, was not a mystery because John bore witness about him. He's understandable. You can know him. He's not mysterious. He's not some divine thing that you just leave to the learned people. He's knowable. He's understandable. See in verse 9, Jesus was the true light coming into the world, right? John, John tells us that John, the Apostle John tells us that John the Baptist was not the light, and John the Baptist knew it. Jesus was the true light. Jesus was in the form of a man and about to make himself known as the Son of God. This is the same person who Scripture tells us gives life to everyone. It's similar to this. The way that phrase, gives life to everyone, is similar to something becoming enlightened. Something becoming enlightened. I know there are a few of you that have borne witness over the last few years that the Bible never made sense to you. But you're starting to understand it. It's an enlightening. The lights are being flipped on. The Holy Spirit does that. Right? The Holy Spirit, who is the Spirit of God. But Jesus, Jesus does something to you. That's kind of like this. Kind of like when someone tells you a story or tells you a joke. And they get through telling the story, they tell the joke, and you're just like, I don't get it. And they're like, no, it's like this. Like, see that this is like this, and then that is like that. Do, do, you, do you get it? No, I don't get it. I'm sorry, I don't understand what you're talking about. But eventually, maybe with enough thought and enough time and meditation on what was being said, you'll eventually, in your car as you're driving away from the situation, go, oh, <laughs> I get what they're saying, right? The lights came on, the switch was flipped, there was an enlightenment, there was an understanding of what was being talked about. The Apostle John tells us that Jesus gives understanding to men. He is understandable and he is the understanding of God. He causes us to know God. Yet, here's the Here's the story that's going to be told. Remember, this is an overture. This is an introduction. Here comes the light. Here comes the light. We're all excited about this, but we come down to the minor keys, the minor scales. The music slows. Because what happens? He came into the world, and the text says that the people did not know him. He came to his own, yet the people did not know him. They didn't understand him. They didn't understand God. They didn't know God. They didn't believe what he was saying. They thought he was a demon-possessed, drunk man, or just a good teacher. Yet, what is so mind-boggling over all of this, it's kind of, like, it's kind of like today, you know, someone who sits in a church for 30 years who just doesn't get it. Right? These people had been waiting for 400 years for Messiah. They had been told time and time and time and time again of what Messiah would be like, who he, what his characteristics would be like, who he's going to be when he comes, like what, what's, what, he, what is he going to do? They were, they were God's people. They were, they were the people of Israel. They were the Jewish culture. They had an understanding at their fingertips that they did not understand. They did not get it. Now, uh, granted, there were a few that did, right? But the text says the majority of the people didn't.
the religious people, the world, the people that were living in that time and had lived for 400 years without a prophetic word of God. They loved their sin so much. They loved their understanding. They loved their thought life. Oh no, I got it all figured out. I know the best way to do this. Me, right? They loved that so much that when Christ came into the world, they didn't get it. They missed it completely. But Jesus is so noble that John does say, as the music picks back up into the major scales, right? It comes back up. He does say that some did come to know him. And those whom Jesus, those who believed in his name, verse 12, were given the opportunity to become children of his. Not children of the flesh, not children of the will of man, right? I can will someone into obedience, obey, right? We've got our ways of doing those things. But this was, to become a child of God is unlike that. It is to become something of what Christ himself was, born of God, otherworldly. Jesus fulfills the will of God by bringing those whom God has called to himself and not losing a single one of them. He provides the way for those whom God is calling to himself to be reconciled to God. You see, your eternal salvation is hinged on who Jesus is and who you know Jesus to be. As one pastor that Emily and I love to listen to says, everybody loves Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus until you start to define who he is. <laughs> Everybody loves the idea of church. Everybody likes the idea of the Christian lifestyle. Until you start to define what it is. He has always been the mirror, the reflection, the witness of God. And he gives light and life to every man to either be condemned or forgiven. So my friends, before we move on from this second heading, do not let it be said of you. Do not let it be said of your family or of your church that if Jesus walked into the room, that you wouldn't know who he was. You wouldn't know who he was. Would you know him well enough to welcome him to your table, to dine with you? The point is that he is understandable. He is knowable. And he wants to be known by you. Third, and finally, we can see from the text that Jesus is plainly God. Okay, so let's run back through this. Jesus is eternally God. Always has been, always will be. Jesus is understandably God. You can know him. He is the understanding of who God is. You can know him. And he wants to be known by you. And third, Jesus is plainly God. What do we mean by plainly? Well, John says in his word, he says that this word or this logos was in the beginning with God bearing witness of God and has throughout all of history. This word became what? Flesh. This word, this logos that was, that expanded light into all of the universe was funneled down into something like you and me. And a point for you to see how condescending this might be, it would be like you or I being funneled down and becoming the form of a mouse to save all of the mice, to go into their dirty lives and save them. You, noble you, 
right? Wise you gave all of it up to become a mouse. The very light that has given witness to God in all of eternity became flesh, and not only became flesh, lived among us. He dwelt among us. He put on a body and was living in a human realm. I'm trying to get you to see the utter wonder of this. Something that was eternal, a substance that is heavenly, from another realm, did something in order to give up that realm. Right? We're all trying to get to that other realm. We have our various ways that we're all trying to seek the higher, more higher understanding way, right? All of the world is trying to do that through various things. We long to understand the cosmos. We long to under, we spend billions of dollars trying to understand them every year. And yet, the God who created everything did the opposite for you. He gave all of that up to come to you, to live among you. And not in a time with modern plumbing. Not in a time with air conditioning. Not in a time where we live in our comfortable houses. Right? The eternal God stepped into life, hard life, gave it up. He became flesh and dwelt among us. My friends, he was, trying, he was not trying to keep himself hidden or revealed. He tried throughout all of history to reveal himself time and time and time and time and time again. And until it was like, okay, they're still not getting it. I love them enough that I'm going to go and tell them. He was making himself plain to us. Now, in that time when Jesus appeared, when Jesus manifested himself to us, the idea of angels and demons were, was not an unfamiliar reality. This idea of, of another realm was not an unfamiliar reality. In fact, it was more real than it is to many of us. They understood that there was something, there was something that was not of this world. And I think that that is just amazing. That this so basic, less technologically advanced ancient world understood something that us super smart modern people have been ignorant of for years. In case you're wondering, I include myself into that, right? <laughs> We're all ignorant of this fact. Our culture has put blinders on this fact. That we're not alone. We're not alone. This world is not alone. I'm not talking about aliens. I'm not talking about extraterrestrial life. What I'm talking about is that there is an invisible world. There is an invisible world. You've heard it a couple of times this morning. You think that what you're living for on earth is cool? There's a whole other realm that we know nothing about. It's happening parallel to our realm, and it's made of a different substance. And up until recently, we've, we've kind of tried to explain all of that away. Well, it's just this. Well, it's just that. We do that so well. We explain things away that God has made plain to us in his word. Up until recently, we've tried to explain it away, but now we're trying to explain it away through words like multiverse or quantum realm, right? Quantum physics is a big deal these days. But the reality is, and they're going to continue to find, that the reality is it's a spiritual one. That there is another realm, a heaven, something beyond us, that exists through uh, across the fabric of the universe that we will one day belong to. It is destined for one man to die and then become then comes to judgment. It is destined for man to die one time and then the judgment. 
We'll all be a part of this this other realm one day, either partaking in it through an eternal relationship with God or in an eternal hell created for those who want to be their own God. You want to be your own God so much? Figure it out. Here, here's a place that sucks. Make it good. Oh, wait, you can't. And then spend eternity trying to do it. That's hell. God's witness, the Son of God himself, stepped out of that realm. I can't, we always say that heaven is up. I'm not sure why, because heaven is around us. It's running parallel to us. It's, it's another world that's happening, congruent to ours. God's witness stepped out of that realm, was born of a virgin, grew into a man to show us through his life the perfect witness of who God the Father is. Jesus is God on display. Jesus is God on display. Um, He is God exegeted, as it were. If you want to understand God, every time you'll come to who Jesus is. He is what God is drawn out and manifested to us. So John testifies later in John 14, uh, verse 9. Jesus says to Philip, because Philip says, show us God, show us the Father. Jesus says to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Who, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? I.e., I have, I have, I have shown you the Father consistently, continually since you started following me. So my friends, would Jesus say that of you this morning? Do you know God the Father through Christ the Son? Or is he still a mystery to you? Do you know Jesus the Son of God? the way that he's to be known. Not merely as a man, not merely as a special person, not merely as a character and an actor in a play that we come together every week to remember as if he were dead, right? This is not a funeral gathering for the Lord Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. He is living and ruling and reigning today. We're joining in with that other realm into worship of that king. Do you know him that way? Do you love him that way? Verse 14, the glory of God has been revealed to all of humanity through Jesus. This is just dumbfounding because when Isaiah sees God, In Isaiah chapter 6, he sees God and the angels and all of the throne room of God. He doesn't even, he doesn't see God. He sees the train of his robe. And he says, woe is me. I don't belong here. I don't belong here. This is a, this is a mistake. You've chosen the wrong guy. This is, this is, this is, this is utterly terrifying. But we've seen that glory through Jesus. Glory that angels can't stop singing about in heaven right now. Jesus is not a theory. God is not a daydream. God was shown to us through Christ himself. So we see the fullness of God, right? It's that verse in Colossians. The fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. We see the fullness of the grace and truth of God. But it goes beyond that. Christians don't just see it. We experience it. So maybe that's another question that I should ask. Not that do you just know this intellectually. Do you experience God on a daily basis? I'm not talking about the little jitters that you get when you think about God. Oh, God makes me feel good, right? I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about relationally. Do you experience him? Do you experience his grace? Do you see his truth? Do you do it? Do you follow him? Do you listen to him? Does your life look more like him than someone of the world? It's the challenge that we're all a part of, those of us in Christ. 
going from grace to grace and glory to glory because we are of this world or we are in this world, but we're not of this world. So it makes it tough, but we receive it. Look at verse 16. He says, for from his fullness, we have received grace upon grace. We experience this. When you meet Jesus, when you know Jesus like this, sin is covered, shame is replaced, guilt is lifted, and light comes bursting into a room, comes bursting into your life, like somebody drawing back the shades in a really dark room. When you meet Jesus and you know Jesus like this, that's exactly what it's like. And every person that has known Christ for, for years, for a, a, more than a couple of years, will tell you the same thing. Once I was lost, now I'm found. I was blind. I was a beggar. I was broken. But now for some reason I'm, I'm healed. I have all the riches of heaven. I understand. Verse 18, it's the capstone of the introduction. It's the last note, so to speak, of the overture. No one has ever seen God. What did God say to Moses? Moses asked God, please show me your glory. Please show me yourself. God said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Oh, the grace of God, that he's shown us his glory in Jesus, and not just caused us to live, or not just not killed us, he's caused us to live. He is our life, he is our light. No man can see God and live, Meaning, no man can see Jesus and continue to live the same way that he's always been living. You walk away transformed, like I said last week, obsessed, needing God. John concludes this introduction with a tremendous statement. The NASB says it best, so I've got it, I've got it here. It says it wonderfully. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, that's the Son, right? Jesus, who's been with him from the very beginning. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Whew. That gives me chills. Something that is eternal has become understandable. Something that is purely understandable has become plain to us through the Lord Jesus Christ, through the man Jesus Christ, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the fullness of God on display, the image of God that we can know, and the salvation of God that we can receive. So again, I ask you, do you know Jesus like this? Is he your friend, sinner? I am a sinner with the greatest brother, the greatest friend ever known to man. And once you get a taste of him, I dare say watch out, because none but Christ will satisfy, because he's the son of God. An eternal wellspring of, as John says, light and life. Amen? Amen. Father, I, I ask you again that you would make this so clear to us. God, that the things of the world, everything, everything would become strangely dim to us in the light of your glory and your grace. Father, let nothing, not one thing, steal our attention away from the worship that Jesus deserves. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.